do you think I can put running a Mastodon server on my resume for the last six months? Is it job worthy? Well, that entirely depends on what job I go for next, I suppose. <laughs> well, Mastodon server administrator, surely. Yeah. I don't know if they're in high demand at the moment, but I can tell you about what I've learned over those six months, I think, and why I did this. It started in 2019 when in the old Ubuntu podcast Telegram channel, someone said, someone should set up an Ubuntu Mastodon instance. And I foolishly said, yeah, go on then, <laughs> and did it. And this was the start of the downfall because... I didn't really plan it very well and ran it for a while on a Linode box, I think, that was quite constrained. And I gave up. But this thing fell apart and I got rid of it. And uh, after a while, I rebooted and started all over again. And that was six months ago. So this is kind of a rebirth of that uh, Mastodon instance. So I'm interested that you had a resource-constrained server before Mastodon had its boost in popularity. <laughs> so I'm interested to hear the contrast of the before times and how things are now in terms of operating a Mastodon instance. Yeah, you won't be surprised to hear <laughs> that when I first set it up, it was quite a, a, a low-spec Linode box because I didn't want to spend a load of money on it because I just wanted a Mastodon instance for me and my friends who were into Ubuntu and wanted to talk about Ubuntu things. And it seemed like that was a good idea at the time. <laughs> and yeah, this was well before the Twitter explosion. And so the, you know, the meteoric rise of people using Mastodon and other alternatives. And yes, now there are more people on Mastodon. And yes, it takes up a lot more resources than it did in the past. But that's countered by the fact that I have intentionally constrained how many users are on this instance. I was very laissez-faire with the criteria of how you get an account on the old one. And on this one, I've said you have to be an Ubuntu member. And that's kept it below 40 people, whereas before it was hundreds and it was killing the server. <laughs> and so the balance of those two things is there's fewer users, even though it's more popular, I've got fewer users. So paint us a picture of those resources. You said it was a constrained server. What did that look like? And what does the one you're running it on now look like by comparison? <laughs> so the first server I ran was, I can't actually remember because I think I destroyed it in a ball of flames, but it was a low end Linode box, one of the like cheaper end machines. It might even have been shared CPU. It was, it was not a high end mm -hmm. box. And the resource that kept running out was disk space, because on those low-end machines, you don't get a lot of disk. And when you've got a lot of people on Mastodon, there's a lot of images that are appearing in the timeline, and all that kind of stuff is cached. And if you've got a lot of users all hitting the site, they all need to be served, those images. Now, there are ways you can work around that. You can host the images elsewhere. You could put them in a bucket somewhere on AWS or some other object storage somewhere, but I'm I'm not that kind of guy. So they're all on the file system of the, of the Mastodon <laughs> instance itself, which yes, is not good. And that was a lesson learned from version one of Ubuntu.social. <laughs> but now the box that it's on now is probably massively overspecced. I've probably gone too far the other way because it's now a Linode dedicated box, which has eight cores <laughs> and 16 gig of RAM and 350 gig of disk space, which the disk is half full. Wow. So, you know, it is using quite a lot of disk space, but it's certainly a lot bigger than, than the first gen one was. Yeah. And do you have to do any like active management of that disk space to stop it filling up or does that kind of take care of itself? Ha! Yes, uh, you do absolutely have to keep on top of it. And this is, I think this is something that's changed in Mastodon itself there are things you can do. There's tick boxes inside Mastodon that each user can tick to say, get rid of my media after a certain number of days, only keep my stuff after a certain number of days. And there's stuff the Mastodon administrator can do as well. But there's also regular housekeeping jobs that you can run that get rid of cached images, like thumbnails of videos, the videos themselves, any other images that get posted in threads. And you can set 
a certain number of days old that it will get rid of them. Mm -hmm. So, for example, a week old. Like You could argue no one's looking at the timeline older than, you know, yesterday or the day before or a week ago. And so we could just get rid of that cache. And that's partially true. It does degrade the experience because if you happen to have a post that is something someone stumbles upon, that image is not there, not on disk, on your instance. If you go to the instance where that post originated, then you might be able to find it. On the first instance, I was really aggressively clearing that stuff out, but I was having to do it manually because not a lot of the tools were there. The admin tools were there. Those tools in Mastodon have improved. And so now it's a copy paste job of a few lines in a cron tab to get rid of that stuff. So I worry about it a lot less now. Yes. So if you're sort of purging assets that are no longer timely, do those ever get re-pulled in if somebody goes back and scrolls back through the timeline or are they gone forever? I'm not entirely sure. I think if you go to the home server, you'll see those images. But I think if you scroll back, I think even if you hard refresh, I don't think they come back. I don't think you can force the server to re-get them. I'm not sure. I'm not entirely sure. I don't tend to test that use case, but okay. it is certainly a very valid question and one why uh, the answer to which explains why I probably don't want to put Mastodon on my resume because I'm clearly <laughs> not an expert in all the operations of this piece of software, which is it's a relatively complicated bit of software running on that box. Yeah, I think if you're going to put Mastodon on your resume, you're probably going to have Ceph right next to it <laughs> to organize all your storage. Right. There's certainly a lot of components to it. And it's one of the more complicated things. I, you know, I've run like Drupal and WordPress and other stuff, but not where I've got 30 or 40 other people who are relying on it and using mobile apps to access it all hours of the day and night and browser tabs constantly and posting images and photos and videos and stuff. So I've got some questions about that sort of, you know, community use. So the first is, what's the uptime been like? You know, ha have there been any fails and how do you deal with that stuff? So that's a great question. And it's been really good. I have used Linode's backup facility, so meaning it's being backed up. I've also added a Postgres backup script. So periodically there'll be a job run that dumps out the Postgres database to the file system so that I get a snapshot of what the database was at a point in time because yeah, I'm not entirely sure how atomic that backup would be that Linode do, mm -hmm. probably at the block level. I don't know, but I thought I'd do that anyway because it might mm -hmm. be useful if I want to go back in time or something. I've not had any catastrophes. I've done a few software updates. I installed it on Mastodon 3. something, and then there was a big upgrade to 4. X and then a few minor upgrades. I did one yesterday, I think it was, or a couple of days ago, and uh, they've all been pretty smooth. And the release notes on GitHub explain what you need to do. And there's a pattern. You might need to update Ruby if there's some CVE in Ruby or some feature in Ruby that the new version of Mastodon needs, then you might need to update that. And it gives you the command you need. It's not hard. And then there's a couple of commands that pull in all the dependencies. And then there's maybe a database migration required, but I haven't seen any of those since the major three to four. And then you just bounce all the services, which is just a you know system CTL restart, each of those things. And it came back and it has come back every time. And actually the built-in Ubuntu unattended upgrades, I've got doing all the operating system level stuff. Notice I haven't mentioned containers or Docker because I'm not using containers or Docker. I was going to ask. <laughs> it's a dedicated box and I'm not using any containers. I did use Docker for the first instance and I really don't get on with Docker. So I, I dumped that and now I'm just installing on the bare metal as it were. And so my other question about community use is because of the federated nature of Mastodon, if you're on an instance, your sort of world view is kind of governed by the instance that you're on and what you can see. So do you have any sort of idea about what your visibility and experience of the broader Mastodon ecosystem is on an instance with just a few dozen users? I'm glad you asked that. So what you're talking about is the federated timeline versus the local timeline. Right. So the local timeline is me, Mark, Ken and a few other people who you know, who have accounts on there, plus a few bots that I created. There's one that posts Ask Ubuntu questions, one that posts Ubuntu bugs, the Ubuntu blog. There's now an official at Ubuntu on the Ubuntu social Mastodon, and that's run by someone from Canonical. Right. So they post as well. 
So yes, the local timeline is fairly limited, but the federated timeline, which shows stuff from other servers, it depends. And it depends on whether you turn on relaying or not. And if you don't have any relays, then you have a very limited view of the rest of the world, of the rest of the Mastodon world. Like, I won't see posts from someone like Stuart, who's on a roleplay gaming Mastodon instance, because I, I don't follow him there. Right. And I don't know, I don't think anyone else on the instance does. And that's kind of a feature of Mastodon. You, you see the local timeline and the federated timeline is somewhat limited. But if you turn on relaying, it becomes more of a fire hose, the federated timeline. Mm. Now I didn't have relaying turned on because it actually eats a lot more data. So I'm averaging around 500 kilobits per second wow. all the time on that box it varies between 300 and 700 kilobits a second which is about five gig a day so it's constantly wearing yes five gig a day and that's without relaying turned on and it doubles if you turn relaying on and that's relaying with one other instance right and you can relay with multiple other instances to pull more into the federated timeline but um i only turned on relaying yesterday and the jump has been quite noticeable that explains a lot. <laughs> You've started seeing more posts, have you? More posts and more posts in languages I don't speak. So I had to go in and work out how you filter the timeline by the languages you want to see. Yes, sorry. And I found that as well. And there were a lot of Japanese and a lot of Chinese, and I didn't understand any of it. And I, I'm not going to go through and read individual posts and manually translate them. So I just, yeah, block those out, filter those out. Which instance did you relay with? I can't remember. There's a bunch of lists online of different uh, instances you can you can relay with, and I just picked one, and right. that looked okay, so I used that one. But yeah, it's been fun, and it's been a learning exercise, and I, I've enjoyed it, for sure. And do you regret your life choices? Is this something you'd do again if you were six months ago and Master Dom was all the rage again? Uh, it's definitely been a good choice to limit the number of people who are on it and not have the whole world on there. Because you look at the outages that people like Fosterdon have had Mm -hmm. with huge influxes of users and the funding that they've had to do. I'm paying for this out of my own pocket. Nobody's funding this other than me. So I think what I might do at some point is maybe scale it back to a smaller Linode box and migrate to a smaller instance just because it'll be cheaper. But other than that, yeah, I found it fun, interesting. I feel in control of my social media timeline and slightly in control of Mark's as well. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry, Mark. But yeah, it's been fun. I would recommend it if someone wanted to have a small instance for themselves and a small group of people. It's not hard and you can do it. I went looking for the best Linux-loving laptop and I think I found it. Where did you find it? Was it in a bush? I found it on the internet. Oh, clever man, <laughs> clever man. But after some significant research. Why? Why were you looking for a new laptop? Haven't you got enough of them? Well, actually, I have got rid of most of my laptops. So during sort of, you know, lockdown and everything, most of my laptops have gone out to friends and family who were in need of computers in that time. And th- there they have stayed. Mm-hmm. Now, my motivation for getting a new laptop was very simple. I was at KubeCon last year. One of my colleagues had one of those MacBook Apple Silicon (laughs) devices. Ah, the green envy hit you. (laughs) Well, I was envious on two counts. One, they are still good hardware and they're pretty and they're compact and they're relatively lightweight, but it was the battery endurance. I don't think Lindsay plugged her laptop in to charge the whole week we were there. The whole week? Yeah, yeah. Yikes. Yeah, f- six days. Meanwhile, me with my ThinkPad P1, it barely gets between outlets on the battery. <laughs> <laughs> and that's not because the battery is old and decrepit. It's because I made probably poor choices when I spec'd that machine up. So I was driven by wanting to get a compact laptop that had decent battery life 
that I could take to conferences and I wouldn't be lugging around a massive, a massive thing. So, um, one of the things that's changed is I used to always get laptops that were really powerful. You know, the P1 has got Xeon CPU and Quadro <laughs> graphics and a 4K touch display and all of this. I think I understand your battery issues. <laughs> right. Yes, indeed. And Dan, consequently, the, the sort of the weight of the thing. But these days I've got powerful workstations that I can connect to remotely. So actually I can have a fairly svelte, lightweight laptop and just connect to the big chonking servers when I need to do work like that. So off I went looking for a laptop and I came up with some requirements. So when I, when I built my shopping list, I decided that I wanted eight hours plus battery endurance. I feel like eight hours feels like a working day. If I'm at a conference somewhere and I've got the laptop out most of the day, you know, chatting to people, laptop lid opening, closing, I feel like eight hours without having to think about plugging into a socket is the minimum requirement. And I wanted something with either a 13 or 14 inch screen and specifically with 1920 by 1200 resolution. And that was specifically because my last two laptops have both been 4K and I feel like there's a penalty on the battery life when you have these high definition screens. There's a lot of pixels to illuminate and that drains the power. And I feel like that 1920 by 1200 is sort of the sweet spot of just enough resolution to be productive, but not having to get into pixel scaling territory. Mm -hmm. You said, I feel like it's, it's eating the battery. Is that a known thing? Like more pixels, basically, it's going to chew your battery harder. Is that just known knowledge everyone has? Yes, I will be very clear. I don't feel it. I know it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I do feel it. I feel the sudden rush of electrons out of the battery. Right. <laughs> right. It makes your hair stand on end. It really does. Um, and I was quite intrigued by these new AMD 6000 series CPUs. In the past, we reviewed an AMD laptop, which had the 4000 series CPUs. So a couple of years ago now, or more, and I was super impressed with them then. So I wanted to have plenty of RAM, plenty of storage, no discrete GPU, again, for battery endurance reasons. And I wanted it to be USB-C only, no barrel connectors or any of that nonsense one connector to rule them all and i wanted a good quality keyboard and trackpad and this is where things get dicey ah. because that was the <laughs> other thing i liked about the macbook you basically want the moon on a stick don't you i want a unicorn yes right. yeah. yes um and i also wanted it to be about a kilo in weight <laughs> and then um just to uh, sort of push out the requirements to uh, the nth degree it must come with Linux pre-installed. Right. Because I, that was my measure of this is a Linux compatible laptop because it ships with Linux. Mm -hmm. So ordinarily people would say, start from the other end with, I would like a Linux laptop and then look at the options available and then filter them down a little bit until they get the one they want. Whereas you've started with the other end. I, I want this high end, lightweight, beautiful, long battery life yeah. device. And by the way, it should run Linux. And it feels like you've started from a pool of a very small number of devices and then shrunk it even further by saying it must run Linux, right? Well, when I started, I thought I'll build the list first and then I'll go and see how many devices qualify mm -hmm. <laughs> so i was i was surprised actually there were more than i was actually expecting but yeah i thought i'm gonna say what i want and if i can't get it then i'm just not gonna get anything i'll wait until something comes along and i suppose it's worth pointing out that this all started with an apple silicon macbook and as impressed as i am and kind of amazed at the progress the asahi linux project has been making Getting a MacBook and running Linux on it is not a sort of conference friendly device because things like HDMI ports don't work yet. So plugging into projectors and things of that nature as a speaker is sort of off the card. So MacBooks were a non option. And the fact that you've said must run Linux has knocked all Apple hardware on the head, really. Yes, mm -hmm. indeed. Right. Indeed. I also made another decision very early on, which is. I decided I wanted one of these AMD 6000 CPUs. Nothing else 
interested me. I'll get into why in a moment. So that consequently, anything with an Intel CPU was kicked off the list. So the Dell XPS series, those, those were all out because they're Intel only options. And at that time, it also ruled out everything that Framework were offering because oh. at the time mm. they were Intel CPU options only too. And then I went round all the usual sort of reputable Linux laptop vendors, the likes of System76 and Entroware and Slimbook and Star Labs. And for various reasons, none of them had anything I could buy because either there was no AMD options, they weren't available in my region, or they had extremely long lead times, like mm -hmm. six to nine months. Oh, wow. Yeah. And HP had no Linux pre-install options whatsoever. And, you know, when you get into the smaller tier vendors, you know, Asus and things of that nature, Gigabyte and what have you, they obviously don't have Linux options either. This isn't sounding terribly promising. No, this is a terrible story, Martin. <laughs> <laughs> no, but then, then the white shining knight comes charging over the hill in the guise of everything from Lenovo in their ThinkPad range. And the entire ThinkPad range from Lenovo has pre-installed Linux options of either Fedora or Ubuntu. And several of the ThinkPads in that range have AMD CPU options. So I now have just one, <laughs> one line of laptops to concentrate on. So I was very impressed with all of the ThinkPads and I got it down to two that I was most interested in. That was the ThinkPad Z13 Gen 1 and the ThinkPad T14S Gen 3. And they both had AMD options. They had all of the bits and pieces that I wanted and it was just about form factor and fit and finish. And in the end, I went with the Z13 because it is beautiful to behold. <laughs> it's not the industrial design of your, is it? <laughs> yeah, that's a good point, actually. Yeah, if you're familiar with the classic ThinkPad design, the sort of the black chassis with the red accents, it's not this at all. It's it's not the ThinkPad keyboard you're familiar with. It's a, a, a low-profile tactile keyboard and it's a large trackpad with no physical buttons you do still get the touch point and all the rest of it so it's just an amazing laptop so the one that i got has the ryzen 7 6850u cpu which is not the absolute best you can get but that was actually a choice of mine because again it doesn't run the clock doesn't run as fast and therefore the battery mm -hmm. endurance is just a little bit better and it has 32 gigs of ram and it has one terabyte nvme which i've upgraded maybe i'll talk about that in the future because that was a game <laughs> and it's got that screen that i wanted 1920 by 1200 and it's non-touch so that also saves a bit of extra power by not having a touch digitizer and the laptop fully decked out with all its gear is just over one kilo in weight. And it's fabulous. And the key question is, do you get eight hours of runtime with it? No. <laughs> uh, I, mm, <laughs> well, well. I get 11 hours of oh, battery okay. life. That'll, that, that, that'll do then. Wow. Yes. So um, I've been using it for several months now and yeah, routinely get 10 to 11 hours of actual use out of this thing. It's absolutely fantastic. And there were some other standout features about this as well. One of the things that really impressed me was all of the packaging was 100% renewable and compostable. And the plastics that are used in the device, 95% of those are recycled and 75% of the aluminium is recycled. It's an aluminium chassis. So actually on sort of the eco-friendly scale, this was pretty impressive. And I think this was a key sort of design decision about how these laptops were created. And then in terms of all of the other things that I cared about, the trackpad is sublime. I do have a MacBook, a, a rather aging MacBook, but nevertheless, this trackpad in the Z13 is the first time I've used a trackpad on not a Mac that is as good as a Mac. It's fantastic. I've been super impressed. And it's USB-C all over, and it has a courage port as well. It does have a courage port, and it has two USB-C ports, yes. Nice. It sounds like you're absolutely delighted with this choice, and you're shopping criteria seems to have been met absolutely perfect 
It really has. It hasn't disappointed in any respect. It came shipped with Ubuntu 2004. And when I chose Ubuntu or Fedora in the ThinkPad build your laptop thingy, that was a £155 discount for choosing Ubuntu or Fedora as opposed to Windows. Now, that discount varies on the model, so it's not always that high, but it is often upwards of 80 quid. And is the the pre-installed image fairly sensible and well set up? I've, I know that when we've reviewed some in the past, there's been some oddities in the in the image that you get. Yeah, the OEM images always vary a little bit. So you get Chromium and Firefox, for example, which is the sort of most obvious, very obvious difference. But you also get all of the recovery tools mm-hmm. and utilities built in. So you turn it on and it takes you through that who are you where are you from? What keyboard layout do you need? And as you're doing that, it then takes you to a screen and it says, if you plug a USB stick in, we'll make you a recovery image. And it does that as part of the initial setup. So that's pretty great. And you can also do that recovery image creation from the system once it's all set up as well. I think the thing I was most impressed with, this has a fingerprint reader, which actually works, which was, um, Mm -hmm. you know, the first time I've encountered that in a very long time. (laughs) Nice. So yeah, I have zero complaints. It's an amazing laptop. I absolutely love it. And I suppose my only concern for the future is Framework are now offering AMD options in their in their refreshed lineup. Watch this space, everyone. Linux Matters is part of the Late Night Linux family. If you enjoy the show, please consider supporting us and the rest of the Late Night Linux team using the PayPal or Patreon links at linuxmatters.sh slash support. For $5 a month on Patreon, you can enjoy an ad-free feed of our show, or for $10, get access to all the Late Night Linux shows ad-free. You can get in touch with us via email, show at linuxmatters.sh, or chat with other listeners in our Telegram group. All the details are at linuxmatters.sh slash contact. Well, I am no longer gaming on my Steam box. What? Hang on a minute. You may remember a few years ago when when we met up for a curry. Around the time that you arrived at my house, I also received a big box of bits from Amazon, which I was using to build my Steam box. And this was refreshing the, the one I'd had under my TV for several years with pretty much whole new insides. And the plan was that rather than having a PC under my telly. I was going to have a big noisy PC upstairs and then I'd have a Steam link in the living room plugged into my TV with a Steam controller and I'd stream all my games in the house like that. Yeah. And that worked very well for a couple of years. But then something happened (laughs) about just over a year ago now. Steam released the Steam Deck. Ah, aha. Yes. So um, I pre ordered one as soon as I could. And it arrived about, yeah, I think, I think the, it's just been about a year since they were, they were actually shipped. Time has flown with those. Yeah. Yeah. And I received it and it's been very good. So I initially sort of, I wasn't sure exactly how the two form factors would relate, whether I would be using my Steam controller with the Steam Deck or whether I would use my Steam Deck sitting on the sofa in the evening and then... I would switch once my partner went to bed. I would then switch and game on the the big PC. But I looked at my setup and I realized, well, the Steam Deck, it has um, obviously a built-in screen and controller and Wi-Fi and everything, so you can play it completely standalone. But it also has a USB port in the top, a USB-C port. And so I thought, well, what instead of, uh, instead of the Steam Link under my telly, what if I had a USB-C hub there? And I had one, which I, I was previously using on my desk for my laptop. And that has an Ethernet port, an HDMI port, USB-C for power delivery, and a USB-A port, which was all I thought I needed. So I thought, well, you know, what I could try at first is I can take all of those things out of the Steam Link and plug them all into this USB hub and plug that into the Steam Deck. And then maybe I can sit that by the telly and I can use the Steam Controller. So that would mean you would omit using the Steam Link, omit streaming from another computer entirely, and just play using the Steam Deck attached to your TV in the lounge with a controller from the other side of the room, like it was a game console or a PC. Yeah, kind of like you do with the Nintendo Switch. But my my initial plan hadn't been to omit the streaming aspect entirely, because I thought, well, rather than having two 
different devices. I could just use the Steam Deck as a streaming client. That's what's now plugged into my telly, and I can stream to that if I want something with like that can do the higher end graphics. You know, I've got a 4K telly. I can't really do 4K gaming on the Steam Deck. But if I wanted to do something with yeah higher end graphics, I could I could stream from upstairs to the Steam Deck and into the telly, and that worked pretty well. And then I thought, well, I actually what I what I didn't really anticipate was how much I like the controls on the Steam Deck and how much I like the feel of it, and I like sitting with it in my lap and using that controller. And I thought, well, I wonder if <laughs> what would happen if I got a really long USB C cable. <laughs> <laughs> Could I plug that into the hub and run that across to the the sofa and plug that into the Steam Deck? And it turns out you can. <laughs> I got a two meter USB C extender, which is a pretty fat cable, <laughs> I have to say. And it seems like it's witchcraft to me because it can do the power, it can do the networking, and it can do the video out. And there's no latency or weirdness or dropping out at all. It just works. So I'd literally just sit there with it in my lap, using it as a controller, playing on my big TV. It does seem like witchcraft, given that that cable and connector is thinner and smaller than an RS-232 cable, which (laughs) carried like 9,600 board text only. And this thing's carrying all of that high definition video when you said a long usb cable i thought you were going to say you ran a usb cable up the stairs to the the streaming (laughs) box upstairs for some reason but that that would be ludicrous so you're basically when you're plugging it into the tv you're just using the steam deck basically as a let's call it a fat controller (laughs) it is the sir topman hat of my living room yes right I'm still usually playing when I'm in that setup in 720p. It can actually, once it's plugged into an external display, it will go higher if you set it higher, but your mileage may vary, basically. It can get quite noisy when you start doing that. So is the Steam Deck your sole gaming device now? You don't use your streaming box at all? Well, no. So something else happened while all this was going on. Well, two things, really. Firstly, I got a smart meter. And secondly, energy got very expensive. <laughs> right. And once I had all this set up, I was... And so so my smart meter has the in-home display. I can see that from the spot I sit where I can also see my telly. It's teasing you out of the corner of your eye. Your peripheral vision is being teased by the energy price. I sat down one evening and I turned on the Steam Deck. So I've just got the Steam Link app installed on the Steam Deck. So you go into desktop mode, you run the Steam Link app, and hey, it's a Steam Link now. And I hit the button to do the wake on LAN call to my PC upstairs. And I launched a game and suddenly my smart meter lit up bright red <laughs> saying, you know, you're using, well, I think my base usage for my house if it is just under 100 watts if nothing's on. If we're just doing sort of normal things, it uses about 200 watts. Just playing a game on my big boy Steam box upstairs uses 400 watts. Right. Compared to my Steam Deck, which barely moves the needle at all, mm. I just don't feel that I can justify. I don't feel I'm, I'm missing out on, on an experience that's worth that much <laughs> when I'm thinking yeah. all day, every day about, you know, how can I make sure I'm economizing and not wasting energy and not wasting money then to just sit back in the evening and say, ah, screw all that. When I could have the perfectly good experience with an absolutely lovely device, which I have to say lives up to the hype. 100%. Interesting. I was going to ask you, do you feel like you're making any compromises in your choice of games that you play as a result of playing on the Steam Deck, which, as impressive as it is, is not a dedicated gaming PC with a big fat GPU in it. In terms of the choice of games, no, because for the past, I'm going to say 10 years, I've done all of my gaming on Linux, which up until recently constrained me quite a bit in terms of the choice of games. Now, with the advent of Proton and you know, just generally since Steam has launched on Linux, a lot less constraint. But I might be missing out on some graphical niceties perhaps some lower frame rates on some games Mm -hmm. but in terms of the actual choice of games i don't feel like i'm constrained at all in fact particularly because of the steam deck verified program i feel like i'm more likely to try out different games than i would have been because i'm not relying so much on you know 
looking at something like WineDB and seeing what the ratings are in there and what tweaks I might need to apply, I can very easily see when I'm considering a game how well this works. It's been professionally tested by someone to see how well it mm. works on that device as well. So in fact, it's probably broadened the choice of games I've gone for. So does that mean that you've been branching out from RPGs with roguelike elements? <laughs> I have, I suppose, yes. I've played <laughs> some beat matching games, some, I think they're called survivor likes, games like Vampire Survivors. In fact, I've been playing Vampire Survivors is what I've been playing, which is an excellent game for the Steam Deck because it's a great one to just pick up and zone out for half an hour while you're sitting on the sofa. I suppose the fact that you've got the Steam Deck in your hands You get the benefit of the controller, but having it on the TV in front of you means you also get the benefit that other people in the room can enjoy watching you play the game as well, if that's what they like doing. And, you know, telling you to put the Red Queen on the Black King and, you know, whatever else, Game of Solitaire or whatever it is you're playing. (laughs) You don't have that, that solitary insular experience that sometimes people get with a switch or a mobile phone or a steam deck where nobody else can see your screen Hmm. i think another thing that's that sort of happened while all this has been going on is that my gaming opportunities have changed in recent years with now being a dad i was wondering how many minutes into this segment you would mention (laughs) you keep saying there's been a change in circumstances and i'm thinking oh he's going to mention that he's a dad no left it right (laughs) until the very end (laughs) what there's been so many changes in circumstances i could i could just pick a different one each time but yeah um i mean yeah it, it used to be you know I used to have the house to myself one day most weeks as my partner would be working on a day that I wasn't. And, you know, I'd spend all day gaming on the TV by myself. Nowadays, I don't really get the opportunity to do that. So having the personal experience is actually really valuable to me, being able to sit there gaming, be physically present, even if I'm not mentally present. (laughs) But also when I do get the opportunity, it's then a very quick switch, one cable in, big TV again, which is really nice. So would you recommend this as a great way to enjoy the hardware that you bought from Valve? I would absolutely recommend it. Seriously, if you see one, if it comes up on sale and you think, oh, I was thinking about that, just go for it. Don't even think twice. 